for joining us today. We're going to get started. Uh, my name is Bill Wareham, and I'm the Program Manager with Aquatic Habitat Canada. And today we're having this webinar and uh, learning dialogue, which will involve the opportunity for you to have some conversation with our panelists. And the subject is habitat offsetting and banking policy under the Fisheries Act. So you're in the right place if you signed up for this webinar. And uh, we really appreciate you joining us for the conversation. Next slide there, Sam. So uh, you may or may not have heard of Aquatic Habitat Canada, but we're a national network supporting aquatic habitat protection and restoration. Um, our group involves a broad group of sectors from across Canada, uh, all who have some interest and or obligation in habitat restoration and protection. And uh, you may have seen our website, aquatichabitatcanada.ca, but if not, down in the corner there, you can see the links are there for our website and our Twitter account and Facebook account. We also have a LinkedIn account. So if you wanted to follow us or share any of your information with us, uh, we'd love to hear from you. And um, just so you know a little bit more about Aquatic Habitat Canada, um, what we're trying to do with our organization is network organizations and individuals who are practitioners, uh, policy analysts, uh, researchers, NGOs, people who are doing restoration work and try and improve the community of practice around this issue and hopefully uh, connect people with each other, have the opportunity to learn from each other, share information about policies, best practices, funding for restoration projects, et cetera. And one of our goals is to help people engage in the current DFO Fish and Fish Habitat Protection Program consultation, which is, as many of you know, ongoing right now under the new Fisheries Act. Uh, the fish and fish habitat protection policies are under review and DFO has an engagement process to consult with Canadians about these issues and this one today on habitat banking and offsetting is one of those specific topics. Um, we also work to support planning and priority setting for aquatic habitat restoration and we have some interesting projects on the go like the uh, pursuit of a national database on habitat restoration uh, opportunities that can help people identify where offsets and habitat restoration needs are the most uh, prominent. So that's some of the work we do. You can see more on our website, but uh, that's a quick snapshot. So as I said, I'm the program manager. I'm also with us today is my colleague, Samantha Lau, who's the communications and project coordinator for Aquatic Habitat Canada. Hi, everyone. And Samantha's um, going to be uh, working the, watching the chat. Uh, looking for questions in the question and answer section of the Zoom links. You can see them below on the bottom bar of your tab there. And uh, we will be recording this webinar to provide to you afterwards. And we'll also be distilling out a short document of highlights, which will be sent to you as well. So you'll have all that information to review again, if you wish to. So the scope of what we want to do today is one, engage in this learning opportunity with those interested in the offset and banking issue. And we have some experts uh, who have thankfully joined us and I'm very grateful for them volunteering their time, both in preparing the presentations and participating with us today. Um, we're going to host um, a range of issues on the habitat offsetting. They all come from different, slightly different expertise and we'll speak to how that work relates to the current Fisheries Act obligations that the federal minister has. And then finally, we'll, after the first hour of presentations, we'll take an hour in discussion. We'll go over some of the key points. Uh, you'll have a chance to ask questions, have dialogue amongst yourselves. And also uh, you can use the chat function, which Sam will explain in a minute, a bit more to talk to each other if you wish. Um, but what we hope to do is highlight some of the key issues that people think should be considered by the Department of Fisheries and Oceans in their uh, policy regarding habitat banking. So um, that's the main intention for today. Next slide there, Sam. So these are the speakers who we have with us today. Mark Posh from University of Alberta, Dave Poulton, Alberta Land Institute, uh, Brad Fairley from Five Smooth Stones Restoration, and Lucas Warner. And we'll uh, take them in that order, uh, roughly 12 to 15 minutes each. And we'll get started with Mark first in a moment after I pass this over to Sam. I think it's going to explain some of the functions on Zoom so you're really clear about 
how to connect with us during the webinar and how to raise your hand, et cetera, for question and answers. Over to you, Sam. Thanks, Bill. So I would just like you to uh, guide you to the bottom bar of Zoom. This looks a little bit different than what you might be used to with the meeting platform. Um, uh, one of the items that I'd like you to check, if you open up the chat bar and beside the two um, all panelists and attendees, there's a drop down bar here where you can select um, the option to address just the panelists or all panelists and attendees. Make sure you're clicking all panelists and attendees if you would like to speak to everyone. Um, and as I noted in the chat, if you have any issues with the Zoom platform, feel free to just message myself. And uh, it's great to see you guys here uh, and the, the uh, interest in today's topic. Um, and then there's also the Q&A and chat function. So if you have any questions, we will be reserving all the questions towards uh, the end after all four presentations. Um, so feel free to uh, populate your questions there um, and interact with the other attendees in the chat if you have um, a point of view you'd like to share or any commentary. Um, and that's all I have. Thanks, Bill. Okay. So um, I'm going to uh, give the opportunity right off the bat to use the chat function. And I'd just like to uh, give an acknowledgement that uh, I'm here on the West Coast uh, in the traditional unceded territories of the Musqueam, uh, Seashelt, uh, Tsleil-Waututh, and, um, and Squamish First Nations. And I would like to invite all of you, because we can't all speak to the land acknowledgement where we all are across Canada. but uh, if you, I invite you to use the chat function and you can just insert uh, your name and what uh, territory of Indigenous communities you are residing in there. And uh, that'll be available for people to see afterwards. So thank you for that. And without further uh, delays, we'll get into what you all came to see, which is the expert presentation. So I'd like to invite Mark Posh to start off. Uh, Mark, as I mentioned, is from University of Alberta in the uh, re uh, renewables uh, department there and has been doing a lot of work on aquatic restoration and conservation work and has done some really detailed research on the effectiveness of various uh, offsetting and banking programs. So over to you, Mark. Thanks very much. Thanks, Bill. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, um, thank you all for being here. I'm joining you today from Treaty 6 uh, territory here in Edmonton, Alberta. Um, today I'm gonna um, discuss with you some of the research that's been ongoing in my lab for the last five or so years on offsetting and banking in particular, and concentrate on some of the lessons that we've learned from this research. I'd like to acknowledge the students and uh, collaborators on the left who uh, did most of the legwork. I get to sit and talk to you today, but uh, they are the true, um, the, the, the people that require the true acknowledgement. And to begin the conversation, um, this is a, a, a period of time where DFO is asking for feedback to recent changes in the Fisheries Act. And you may be familiar with the Fisheries Act, so I'll go through it quickly. But uh, the Fishery Act uh, states a prohibition against work undertakings or activities known as WUA that result in the death of fish by means of other than fishing. And this um, also includes the harmful alteration, disruption, or destruction of fish habitat. And What's relatively new is that proponents under, that are um, have works, undertakings, or activities that result in residual effects on fish or fish habitat will need to have an authorization and must include uh, submit an offsetting plan with their application. For my talk, I'm going to be concentrating on uh, the science advice from the research that we've conducted, and I'm going to be talking in two particular parts. The first is uh, in developing offsetting uh, in general and providing some science guidance in offsetting strategies. And the second relates to um, banking in particular. And I won't be focusing on advocating for what I think DFO should be doing. What I'm going to be doing is just providing an overview of the science we've had and some lessons learned. And so for the first part, uh, oh, um, this is a paper that was uh, authored by Sebastian Tice, who I think is uh, joining us on the call as well, as well as our uh, several collaborators. And what we want to do is look at the relationship between uh, compliance, uh, so regulatory compliance, and ecosystem function in habitat offsets. 
And so the objectives of this was to see if there was a relationship between compliance and, and uh, ecosystem function for offsetting projects, and to assess whether or not there were trends across regions, scale of project, the targets of the project, the methods used for offsetting, and the ecotypes uh, available. To do this, uh, we used a systematic review process where we looked at all available studies, grey literature, um, and government reports that were available, and we developed an inclusion criteria for what, um, what was included within our review. And just to, to give you the bare bones uh, assessment of this, I gave you the citation earlier and I'd be happy to share with you the publication. Uh, we were really concentrating on projects that had a before after type of um, assessment, typically done at using rapid assessment methods where we can look at the project from both a compliance perspective and an ecosystem function. So once the proponent um, said they were going to do, the, do something, did they in fact do what they said they were going to do and whether or not there was an attributed function related to that. And so I'll give you a bit of um, data that we, uh, starting with compliance. So these are, the, these are just uh, stacked bar graphs of the different levels of compliance subdivided by the location of the project or the system type. And these are enumerated from the lowest level of compliance in the bottom uh, in the, the most, I guess, uh, lightest gray color to the highest level of compliance with the darkest gray color. And so we could just look at the location. We have our systematic review uh, was predominantly um, had projects from Canada, United States, and Europe. We had some projects from Australia, but there weren't a sufficient num uh, sample size to really uh, do much with it. So we really concentrate on North American and European fresh waters. Uh, and you can see that the rates of compliance um, differ significantly across the regions and that Canada and Europe did significantly better as far as uh, rates of compliance than the United States, although they are relatively close to one another. As far as system, wetlands had the lowest rates of compliance uh, in relation to lakes, uh, streams, or rivers, but there is a, a bit of nuance uh, to this. And so US seemed to have a little bit less compliance than other areas, and wetlands seemed to have a little bit lower compliance scores. But what about ecosystem function. And here we show not just location and system, but we looked at the scale of the project and, and there, are, there are definitions in the paper about what small, medium and large are and the number of project targets. So were you looking at um, attempting to offset just habitat, were you using a productivity target, were you using more than one target and what that meant. And again, there's quite a bit of data here to dissect. So I'll just give you maybe the Coles Notes version of this. And again, US projects had uh, significantly lower functional scores than uh, European Union or Canadian ones. And wetlands did uh, had lower functional scores than some of the other systems as well. And we'll, we'll talk about some of the lessons that we've learned as far as why we think that may be the case. What was really interesting was that there was a positive relationship between ecosystem function and the scale of the project. That's to say that larger projects tended to have more ecosystem function than smaller projects. And the more project targets that you had, the better you ended up doing um, overall. And these are, I think, very important lessons that we could use for, under, uh, for implementing offsetting strategies uh, in Canada more broadly. So what we found with this systematic review was that compliance and function improve when the scale of the project um, is larger, so larger projects tended to be better. When you had more than one target, uh, so two or more targets tended to be do better than a single target. Um, in certain uh, system types, um, Rivers and lakes and streams tended to do better than wetlands, although wet, wetland offsetting has been done for, for much longer. And by location, and this could relate back to the legislative framework that uh, was being developed for the particular offset. So those are, I think, particularly useful lessons learned, but there's, I think, a lot more to really delve into that I think would be useful to sort of 
broaden this discussion. And the big question that we had was, well, those are good patterns, but what is the relationship between the two, function and compliance? And in the scoring system that we used in our systematic review, we were able to go through each individual report and relate compliance scores with functional scores. And uh, in the bottom here, these are the compliance levels from low levels of, of zero all the way to three. And these are the distribution of functional levels within each of those compliance levels. So not surprisingly, uh, under low compliance levels, we had our lowest functional levels. And as you move up compliance level, you see that low functional levels going down. And so as you improve compliance, you also improve function. But what's interesting is that it does tend to asymptote or it tends to sort of level off at a certain rate. That means that once you have compli uh, compliance, you sort of get this, this leveling off of ecosystem function. And so uh, this was really interesting to us because we were a little bit surprised of how weak of a relationship there was between function and compliance. There was a relationship, but we would say it was a weak relationship, which to put in other words is to say that compliance can be high, uh, that is proponents can do what they're being told to do, but that doesn't necessitate uh, that the ecosystem will function as expected. Some of the follow-up work we did afterwards was to look at whether or not there was a threshold relationship between these two. Was there something that really caused uh, certain projects to, to have better function than others? And this was subsequent to the publication that we did, so it's relatively new analysis. And so what Sebastian did was he took all the rapid assessment scores and he looked at whether or not there was a relationship between the size of Hobset. And in fact, there was a very strong sort of asymptote at about the five uh, hectare level where we started to see this leveling off of, of ecosystem function, which suggests to us that there actually may be a sort of minimal threshold for the type of success criteria you can get from an offset where above five hectares in size, you tend to have good functioning ecosystems and below five hectares in size, you have a bit of more of, uh, of a mismatch or gradient. And so this was really interesting that we started to see a threshold for ecosystem size for the, for, for the, the ecosystem uh, function criteria. But again, this is based on the 230 projects that we're able to evaluate using our inclusion criteria. And we suggest that this may be an important consideration for future offsets is to look at this relationship between project size and uh, ecosystem function. And so to quickly wrap up the first bit, we have uh, shown a relationship between uh, compliance and function, but it did not guarantee that the two uh, worked together. But large projects tended to better and we had a bit of a threshold at five hectares. We noted that lakes tended to be an underutilized system uh, that did show high relative ecosystem functional scores and that projects improve when you use multiple targets. So uh, especially productivity uh, or habitat targets tended to do uh, quite well. And not surprisingly, uh, uh, um, creating entirely new ecosystems was more challenging and at lower functional scores than restorative or enhancement measures. Um, so that's a first part, just a bit of an overview there. And I'll go quickly through their second part about habitat banking. And this is a paper that's in review currently. And it's focused in the same way on a systematic review, focusing on uh, the United States where we had sufficient data and looking at effects of banking and no net loss goals. And so for this uh, study, we had uh, included 1,644 banks that were analyzed. This is about half of all the banks in the United States that were included. And we used the Ribbits uh, data um, network for this analysis. And I'll go through this quickly just because uh, I'm running out of time, but there is, this is a, a, just a geographic map of the different um, areas in the United States uh, showing the distribution of different bank types where we have species specific banks, wetland banks, stream banks, and then we have 
multiple ecosystem banks, multiple species banks, or group banks. And as you can see, just by the difference in the, the percentages, it differs widely across the continental United States. The different uh, regions have different um, banking types, which may not be surprising, but really um, when we talk about developing a national strategy, it's important to know the ecosystem and ecoregion uh, for, for context. And so to, if we were to broad brush this in the West, we tend to see more species focused banks in the Southwest, there's a bit more of a mixture. In the Southeast, there's also a mixture. In the Midwest and the Northeast, you tend to have more wetland banks. And these relate largely in our view to the history of how banking occurred. Um, and we, we touch on that in the, in the paper. And so these regional differences are, are important to note uh, for what we're gonna talk about in a second, as far as capacity for banks to take on um, new, uh, new credits. So these regional differences were mostly due to the ecosystem and also the history of the legislation in those areas. And we noted that there was relatively little focus on species or multi-target banks. Uh, again, I apologize, this is an uh, analysis from 1995 to 2020. And these are the different types of banks that were done or the reasons they were done. And we just divide this by proportion and area, just to say that we did it both ways. And basically what I want you to look at is the different bars and whether or not they're going upwards or downwards to get a trend of what is uh, happening through time for each of these banking approaches. And what we found was that typically this push towards preservation has been increasing through time as well as rehabilitation, but preservation has seemed to really have taken off. And this is an important consideration because the uh, initial push for habitat banks was towards more um, creation or establishment than it was for preservation. And this increase in preservation uh, to us is a, is a bit of a troubling signal that uh, banks are moving away from the in initial intended targets. And we noted a, a sort of decrease in the establishment and reestablishment and enhancement uh, targets uh, for banking. So there are significant uh, changes in different methods that have been used for banking, but uh, we argue that this push for increasing preservation is really um, moving away from the intended target and preservation in our view is not really the, uh, the means of achieving no net loss. And that we argue that this is related mostly to regulatory uh, preferences. It's, it's easier to preserve uh, things than to attempt to uh, establish um, things from scratch. And so preservation may be easier approach, uh, a less onerous approach, but one that we argue may not provide the same benefit for the, for the species that are, are attempted to be um, offset. And when we look at this from a, a simple schematic, I just want to leave you with this, this note and I'll, 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 I'll um, leave it there. If we were to assume 100 acres of banked habitat using the United States framework, the breakdown across the board would go something like this. Out of 100 acres banked, we noted that you would get about one acre where you would have an area in functional gain. And we said that this is achieving the goals of no net loss. You'd have about 20 acres where you'd have an area gain. And we, we view this as a partial uh, of um, reaching the targets of no net loss. You have 33 acres of some functional gain. Um, again, we say a partial effect for no net loss, but surprisingly, you would have about 46 acres where you would have no gain. And this is largely due to the, the preference to move more towards preservation than the other uh, banking targets. So at even best case scenario, only every second banked acre leads to a no net loss goal. Uh, for time, I'm going to just uh, maybe just go through this quickly. We just quickly looked at the capacity for banks and whether or not they have the capacity for future, um, for future needs. And there is a big increase in capacity in the last couple of decades, but we know in future that this may not actually, um, our prediction is that the, the capacity will go down. 
Uh, the important notice of this, and sorry, I'm just running out of time. I'll just um, leave you with a couple of thoughts, is that it, the capacity issue is one that it looks good on paper, that uh, it looks like there is sufficient capacity. However, when we delved into it, 92% of the reserves that had capacity in the West were species banks, and 91% of the reserves that had capacity were held in only two very large banks, which, which begs the question of whether or not that truly is capacity. If you're really focusing on one, uh, one uh, banking type species and across only two very large banks. So that's an important bottleneck to consider. Capacity may seem to be okay, but where are the bottlenecks? Similarly in the South uh, East, we noted that 74% of the reserves were in wetland banks. And so where we need these banks to occur may not be for the species or the, the banking types that we really want uh, to be there. Okay, I apologize for going a bit over. I'll just wrap up quickly. Um, we've noted in banks that preservation approaches have tended to overtake the other forms of um, banking types like habitat creation. And our, our view is that preservation does not meet the, the spirit of no net loss requirements. The issue of reserves and capacities using United States data suggests that there's adequate capacity, but this may only be on paper since there are a bottlenecks that we note that may be important, especially related to the bank type and location. And we argue that that banking, as far as a framework for Canada, needs to consider it not just in the piecemeal approach, but ways that we could build banking networks. If we can combine banks, this has been shown in other types of conservation planning, that we can get more uh, benefit out of looking at banks in a sort of a network view as opposed to a piecemeal view. And this may actually have more ecological benefit. And this is a big uh, red heron or elephant in the room for us is that if we're preserving things in perpetuity, the issue of dramatic change through climate and land use uh, predictions may not mean that those banks that we have today will reflect the areas that we wanna preserve into the future. So hopefully that had provided you with some context into some of the research that we've been up to and given you some food for thought on uh, the lessons we've learned for offsetting and habitat banking. Thanks so much. Okay. Well, thank you, Mark, so much. That's a very thought-provoking analysis and uh, really appreciate it. Uh, to our participants, um, as Sam mentioned, we're not going to take questions right now. We're going to take questions through the question and answer function on Zoom there. And uh, just coincidentally, Mark has to race off. He got his appointment to get his vaccine. So congratulations, Mark. He's scooting out to get his shot. And then he's going to dial back in by phone to our... Uh, a dialogue conversation portion of this. So if you have a question for Mark, please post it in the question and answer tab. And if we don't get to it during the actual dialogue, um, Sam and I will be reflecting all these questions back to the participants and they can contact you or you know we'll make sure you get an answer. So thanks again, Mark. And so moving right along, uh, we're gonna next have Mark Poulton speak to you. And Mark is from um, the Alberta Land Institute, which is an independent group at the University of Alberta. Uh, he works primarily on uh, research and conservation policy and has done a lot of uh, thoughtful analysis of this issue. So I'll toss it over to you, Dave. Great, thanks, Bill. Um... Yeah, so what I'd like to do today is just give you an overview of some of the, the main concepts in habitat offsetting and offset credit banking. Uh, Mark has already touched on, on many of these, but uh, perhaps I can uh, give a little bit more of a framework to, uh, to ground our discussion this afternoon. So first I'd like to uh, talk about what offsetting is and uh, some of the key, uh, key attributes that it, uh, it exhibits, um, where we see offsetting in Canadian policy, uh, where look at offset delivery mechanisms, including banking, and then <clears throat> uh, have a, a little bit closer look at banking and the advantages and challenges that it carries with it. Uh, before doing that, I would like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from Treaty 7 territory uh, in Calgary, 
uh, the, the traditional territory of the Blackfoot Nation, the Siksika and the Pagani and the Kainai, also the Tatina and the Stony Nakoda Nations and the Métis uh, Section 3. So biodiversity offsets is uh, uh, a concept that has been around for a long time. Um, actually, DFO's program in 1986 was one of the first formal programs in the world. Uh, the, uh, during the same uh, sort of time period of the mid-1980s is when uh, American offsetting and, and banking systems started going, getting going on, uh, on wetlands. And then uh, it was uh, subsequent to that that the Americans just decided to uh, develop their species banking. Um, but uh, this, uh, this definition was developed uh, by the Business and Biodiversity Offset Program to uh, try and give a generic definition to the, the concept. And they arrived at uh, measurable conservation outcomes resulting from actions designed to compensate for significant residual adverse biodiversity impacts arising from project development after appropriate prevention and mitigation measures have been taken. Um, there's a, a lot of uh, interesting words and concepts within that that I will uh, get into, um, but uh, it suffice it to say that it is um, quite a, a broad concept and um, also one that is spoken of in various um, verbiage and, and terminology. Um, so some of these terms at the bottom are you, you see coming up in the literature or in different programs. They, are, they all are more or less synonymous, although they may have um, particular nuances to, to their particular use. Um, by the way, the Business Biodiversity Offset Program was a, an international collaboration of about 85 um, in environmental organizations, businesses, uh, financial organizations and government agencies and operated from 2004 to 2018 and, and issued a, 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 a series of quite authoritative publications on different aspects of offsetting. So one thing that is almost universal in any discussion of offsetting is some reference to the mitigation hierarchy. Uh, it's certainly found in uh, all the uh, academic literature and in almost every policy document, including uh, the various versions and, and iterations that DFO uh, uh, fish habitat policy has gone through. So the hierarchy uh, proposes that there should be a, a, a preferred sequence of uh, mitigation that um, our first uh, priority should be to avoid impacts wherever possible. Those, those impacts that cannot be avoided should be minimized and mitigated through, um, through technological or operational norms and, and guidelines. Um, the, where possible, there should be restoration on site, um, so at, particularly after the construction phase of a project in order to restore it um, as much as possible. And again, uh, minimize that, uh, that residual impact. And then the residual impact um, in our conventional impact assessment and mitigation, we, we do an assessment uh, saying that essentially that that is a given, uh, that, that environmental loss, and that is weighed against the social and economic benefit of the project going ahead. Um, what offsetting brings into the mix is that it uh, expects uh, a quantification of that residual impact and then seeks to create environmental gains uh, of an equivalent amount and usually an equivalent type. Uh, now, um, that raises a lot of questions about how one assesses the equivalency of losses and gains. Um, both, a, um, what degree of similarity is required uh, between them in terms of their ecosystem characteristics. Also, um, what metric can uh, properly be used in order to reflect the uh, the, the values that are at stake. So in, in this case, um, I've nominally said we have a residual impact of minus four. That would be offset by, a, a, um, by an improvement of plus four. And then of course, if one decides what is an improvement to the ecosystem and, and decides that that can be practically undertaken, there is the option of creating a net gain so that conceivably we could have a combination of 
uh, you know, development of the landscape together with ecological gains that would result in a net gain. And in fact, development theoretically could be a driver for ecosystem improvement. Uh, but this does, a uh, fairly simple graph uh, hides a, a myriad of, of technical and in some cases philosophical issues. So, but the bottom line here is a very simple uh, concept that it, offsetting really involves exchanging nature lost for nature gained. And I put nature gained in quotation marks because of course the nature that we may produce uh, may not be nearly as complex or functional as the intact nature that was lost to development. So why would we offset? Well, first of all, uh, it's to improve environmental outcomes. And in theory, our goal should be no net loss or a net gain. Um, even if we fall short of that goal, we could still could see a substantial improvement over a non uh, uh, um, an, a mitigation strategy without offsetting. Um, it also shifts the cost. It imposes the cost of environmental impacts on those that cause them, those that are creating the land and habitat disturbance. Um, that shifted the cost gives a greater incentive to developers to avoid and better mitigate so as to minimize their, uh, their residual impact and thus their uh, offset liabilities. And it also uh, it shifts the discussion somewhat that rather than uh, coming towards environmental mitigation and, and project planning with a, a mindset that we accept a certain amount of residual loss, that loss is the price we pay for progress, it puts us into a, a mindset we are, where we are uh, seeking opportunities to create a neutral or positive impact. Now, offsetting is actually quite common worldwide and has become uh, much more common in the last 20 years. There's now over 100 uh, jurisdictions uh, internationally that have some legal requirement or policy requirement for offsetting and a great many ex examples of project proponents that have undertaken offsetting on a, on a voluntary basis. Um, here in Canada, at the provincial level, almost every province has uh, some form of offsetting policy applying to one aspect or another of their ecosystem. Um, the most common is uh, wetlands, uh, which are covered in most provinces, um, but uh, uh, there's more broad-based uh, policies in place in, uh, in British Columbia. Uh, in Ontario, there is an Endangered Species Act that includes offset provisions um, under their overall benefit concept. Uh, here in Alberta, we do have uh, the opportunity to develop quite a broad uh, um, offset policy, but we've seen um, uh, a lot of talk about that, but little movement on, uh, unfortunately. Federally, uh, the focus of, of our discussion today, of course, is uh, the fish habitat provisions of, uh, of the Fisheries Act, Section uh, 35.2, apply to both freshwater and marine environments. Um, there's also a federal wetland policy with a no net loss goal. Uh, species at risk uh, covers um, development uh, of affecting the habitat of species at risk. And there is a draft offset policy that is applicable to section 73 of permitting of activities that do impact species at risk. Um, there is also uh, uh, an overall federal policy that uh, is currently under review and I understand will be updated um, this year and that's the operational framework for the use of conservation allowances that was published by Environment Canada as it was then known in 2012. Now to, um, to, to move on to the offset delivery mechanisms, generally there are three ways in which offsets can be delivered. Now, um, Mark referred kind of to the, the technical aspect of it that we typically see either habitat restoration, the creation of new habitat, enhancement of existing habitat, or the protection of existing habitat. And as Mark referred to, uh, there is, um, in practice, there seems to be quite a preference for preserving existing habitat, although conceptually and mathematically, that makes it very difficult to 
to uh, achieve a, a no net loss goal. Um, but how, how do we deliver those things um, in, in a systematic way? Well, the, uh, the three options that are commonly uh, recognized are there's project specific offsetting, whereby uh, each offset is custom designed to match the impacts of one particular uh, development and set of impacts. And so that offset can be carefully tailored. It may not be carefully tailored, but in theory, it could be carefully tailored um, in order to match the impacts um, quite directly. Um, what we're uh, getting into a larger discussion about today is offset credit banking. And there, uh, a bank of offset projects can be undertaken at any time in advance of development, undergo some process for uh, recognition and certification, and then the certified credits can be made available for application to development projects later to meet the, the, the uh, offset obligations that arise later. And then finally, uh, many jurisdictions use in lieu fee programs whereby a, a, a developer can satisfy their offset obligations simply by paying a fee into some fund that it will then be later used for conservation uh, projects for offset purposes. Uh, I, I think uh, we can take in lieu fees off the table for the rest of this discussion, unless uh, somebody wants to raise it again. I don't think it's currently under contemplation um, for, uh, for DFO's program. So um, to, to drill down a little bit on offset credit banking, the key characteristics really are that offset credits are decoupled from any particular development impact. So um, credits are it's in a sense made somewhat more generic so that they may be applied to a range of development impacts. And typically the, uh, that range is defined geographically and in terms of similarity of ecosystems. And the American terminology for that that is um, I think pretty broadly used beyond the US is that that's the service area for a credit. Um, now, once the credits are, uh, are produced, they can be pooled and aggregated. Um, so we can be dealing with um, if you like chunks of, of offset credits that can be, uh, can be dealt with in a somewhat more efficient way than the one by one uh, process of, of uh, project specific offsetting. Um, that, that, that pooling again can be based on on geography, which is service area, or it may be that it, you know you simply have one owner that holds a bunch of credits and therefore becomes a, an ess essentially an efficient dispenser and distributor of those credits out for use. Credits may be transferable assets. They aren't in all systems. Um, and uh, I'll comment further on that, I think in my next slide. And they may be applied to more than one development impact. So uh, not that one, credit may be applied to a variety of development impacts, but rather uh, a set of uh, offset credits may be divided up among uh, different development impacts. So there's, there's two types of credit banking. Uh, Self-banking, or sometimes called first-party banking, allows the developer themselves to go ahead and create a, a bank of offset credits in anticipation that they're going to need those credits for their later development projects. Uh, that, uh, that has the advantage that uh, essentially they, they can be confident that they can meet their offset obligations later on. And we, have, we collectively have the advantage that we can demonstrate that the offsets are ecologically functional before uh, we use them in the regulatory process. Um, but self-banking, again, it's, it's one party taking care of their own future needs through a banking arrangement. Third-party banking um, is a somewhat more entrepreneurial enterprise whereby any party or are perhaps subject to some uh, authorization process, um, a, an independent party can undertake uh, a process to do the ecologically beneficial work, produce the credits, hold those then in a bank and then make those available for sale to developers. 
and they, so there is essentially a, uh, a banking business. And this is um, developed the way it developed in the US, um, first under their wetlands banking, later under their conservation uh, species banking. And uh, there's also been a lot of experimentation with banking in Australia and uh, a few other jurisdictions. In Canada, there's been a lot of talk about banking, um, but uh, we haven't really gotten any um, banking system off the, uh, off the paper and in, onto the landscape. Now we do have uh, under DFO's process, uh, some self-banking for several years, there has been uh, self-banking arrangements made with individual proponents, mainly large uh, developers who have ongoing activities in fish habitat. Um, but the, uh, the new, uh, new amendments to the Fisheries Act that came through Bill uh, C-68 uh, it formalized those arrangements and, and gave some statutory recognition to the, uh, to the legitimacy of self-banking. Um, unfortunately, in what I believe is a missed uh, opportunity, uh, Bill C-68 did not uh, make available third-party banking. And um, it's my hope and, and to some extent my understanding that um, DFO will be, uh, will be pursuing that in the next couple of years here and, and that we may see that. Um, before, um, before too much time has passed, but it is currently uh, not anticipated under either the current policy or uh, the current version of the legislation. The advantages of, uh, of offset credit banking are, are twofold. Um, ecological advantages, um, it, the fact that uh, offset proponents and banking proponents are undertaking uh, banks independently, uh, moves them towards creating larger offset sites, which is, uh, uh, as was stated earlier, have a better chance of ecological success. Um, they can be strategically targeted to high value uh, habitat. And the, perhaps most importantly, we can uh, make sure that they are working, delivering their uh, ecological advantages in advance of the development impacts. It can also create economies of scale and specialized skills community that can deliver offsets um, most uh, efficiently. There are challenges of administration, making sure that credits are clearly defined and, uh, and available and so on. And with that, I will wrap up my time. I do want to uh, just make uh, all of you aware, uh, my organization, the Alberta Land Institute is currently running uh, an eight part series on biodiversity offsetting. Uh, we have yesterday, or rather on Monday, we completed session two. Um, on uh, May 31st, session six, we'll be dealing with uh, making offset credit banking work. And we will be having speakers from uh, from the US, from Australia, and from Europe, uh, dis describing the different banking systems in those jurisdictions. And with that, I am done. Okay, thank you, David. It, uh, appreciate you highlighting the complexities of what we're facing. And one thing I forgot to mention to our audience is that uh, if you have not been made aware of or seen the DFO Fish and Fish Habitat um, Protection Program, a consultation and engagement website. Uh, it's located at talkfishhabitat.ca and Sam will post that link in the chat so you can see that. And in that site, there's a record of their briefing documents. There's record of webinars that they've recorded, uh, which they have hosted and uh, some open house sessions as well. So there's a wealth of information there to enable you to further learn about these issues. and. Also, there's an input portal so that you can provide comment on these policies. And it's actually the first round of input on the online portal is April 30th. So if you wanted to throw your comments at this point in that's uh, sneaking up on us uh, this week. So anyway, um, we're running a little bit over time, but I just wanted to say, Brad, who's our next speaker, feel free to take your entire 15 minute allotment and same with Lucas. So we'll run a bit into the question period, but I think that's uh, worthwhile because you guys have a great uh, wealth of information here. So Brad Fairley, who's joining us next, um, has over 35 years of experience working in the field on these issues and has actually completed over 100 projects. Uh, so has 
an amazing amount of hands-on experience, both in Canada and the U.S., with habitat restoration uh, projects and banking. So thanks for joining us, Brad. Over to you. Good. Has everybody got my screen okay, Sam? Looks great. Okay, good. Okay, I'm going to dive into habitat banking. I'm going to repeat some of the stuff that Dave Poulton has said with a little bit of a personal spin, given the fact that I spent 15 years doing this in the U.S. So with that, I'll dive into this. A little bit of outline what I'm going to cover. I'm going to cover banking in general, um, specifically what is habitat banking. I'm going to break it up into, you've heard these topics before, proponent-led banks, in-lieu fee programs, third-party banking in a summary. Um, what you're going to see down the side are some photos of projects that I've worked on. I will do mostly stream work, and uh, you're going to see projects from Oklahoma, Texas, North Carolina, Southern Ontario, Saskatchewan, BC, lots of different projects scattered around North America. So again, a little bit of definition. Someone care, what is habitat banking? Somebody carries out habitat improvements. They find the site, they design it, they construct it. They do post-construction monitoring, whatever's required by the regulatory agencies and it generates credits. The credits are put into the bank and the credits are used later on to get a project permitted so that it can go ahead and be developed. Uh, generally not tied to a specific project or permit, which is something that Dave uh, hit on as well. And again, the critical point is that it's done in advance. So that's really a, a, a very beneficial point about this. So history of habitat banking in Canada. The DFO didn't allow it until 2016 when they made a policy change, which was done internally prior to the revisions made to the act. Uh, in 2019, they specifically allowed banking and they indeed are in the process of uh, trying to encourage it for a variety of reasons, which I'll get into. So I'm gonna speak specifically right now about proponent-led fish habitat banking. So basically the proponent is responsible for creating the bank. They're responsible for generating the credits and depositing them in the bank. The proponent is the only agency that can use the credits. The proponent cannot sell the credits to any other agency. That's, that's the system we're in right now. Um, I've done several banks. I did one in 2016 for the city of Kitchener, 8,700 square meters of warm water fish habitat. Another for the city of London, uh, 2,500 square meters of warm water fish habitat. Last I spoke to DFO, they said there's about 20 others under development. They're fairly tight-lipped about it because they're, they're proprietary, so they don't really uh, get into it in too much detail. Lucas Warner, who's going to follow me, is going to talk about a project that we're we're in the process of working on, which is a little bit different, but similar. So again, the advantages, I want to speak of the advantages, there's a variety of advantages to the proponent for doing this. One is the certainty for project, for the project is there's timing and cost for the permitting is known up front. This is a huge issue. If you're in the private sector and you're trying to get a development done, one of the big factors that affects you is how much time it takes you to get it permitted so you can get it going. So that's a big issue. So certainty is very valuable to a proponent. Um, you can do larger habitat projects. They're more, more cost effective. Again, this was mentioned by other speakers. You can sometimes do better on ratios because the, the offsetting is proven to be working. So sometimes you can negotiate better ratios. The other thing you can do is uh, DFO will entertain the idea about using credits rather than a letter of credit. So you can encumber credits in your bank, which therefore saves you from having to go and get a letter of credit, which is a financial instrument. Um, so the advantages are also a spill over to DFO. It takes the pressure off in the sense that we're not constantly being squeezed by the proponent who wants their permit issued. So it's done at a somewhat more leisurely pace. And so it's not all under the gun all the time. Again, for DFO's perspective, the offsetting is already done. Uh, they don't have to worry about whether it's going to be effective or not, um, because some of them, again, now they're stretching out to five, 10 years. And so DFO enters into this knowing that the, cr the credits are valid, the, the offsetting project worked. Uh, the permitting for DFO is a lot more straightforward, because basically if they have the credits available to offset for the project that they show up wanting a permit for, it's good. Um, they don't have to chase proponents for failed offsetting. This is a, a significant problem that they have. The other one is there's no political interference where the premier of Alberta phones up and says that they really need this development to move forward and so they need to get their permit granted ASAP. So there are a lot of advantages for both a proponent and for DFO in this. There's also some disadvantages currently. Right now, 
DFO is trying to sort out their policies and procedures. And so for those of us who are actively doing it, we're getting a fair bit of inconsistency in terms of what's going on. Uh, one person says this, somebody else says this, somebody wants, disagrees with the person who held the position previously, they want a more strict, you know, there's a variety of issues there. So we're dealing with a bit of a moving target right now. They're working on it and I think they'll get this worked out, but right now it's a bit of a, a, a moving target, if you will. The other thing is, from my perspective, I don't think DFO is doing a very good job of incentivizing. They want to encourage habitat banking, they've said that but they're not doing what they could do to facilitate that and encourage people to go that route. Uh, I've been involved in a couple of projects where the cost of the pre-construction and the post-construction monitoring was going to be more than the value of the credits generated, so proponents back away. And I've had some clients that have simply stopped doing habitat projects because, because they, as it turns out, they're not going to be allowed to sell the credits. And so some clients are just going, well, I'm not even going to bother to, to restore habitat because there's no nothing in it for me, which is a very, very unfortunate situation. These clients are keen to do the right thing, but DFO is not helping them out in that regard. So there's some disadvantages to the current system that we're operating in. So, I, so that's where we are right now. We're in proponent-led banking. We're trying to figure it out. Some work's underway. Some good things are happening. But what I want to do is I want to challenge the system, talk about some other banking options. Again, Dave Pull mentioned some of these, which are operating in many other jurisdictions, which provide, uh, in my view, complementary opportunities to proponent-led banking. I'm a big fan of proponent-led banking, but there are other mechanisms, and I think DFO needs to look at those. So I'm going to speak about in-loop fee programs. Again, not currently allowed under the Fisheries Act. I was watching the chat box and someone was highlighting that they're not. Uh, but I think it's worth consideration. I'm gonna speak about what it is and the advantages and disadvantages to it. So essentially the, it doesn't replace proponent-led banking. I wanna, I wanna make that clear. Um, so an in-lieu fee agency develops a fee schedule. The proponent pays a fee for the in -lieu, to the in-lieu fee agency, whoever that is, which assumes responsibility for the offsetting. The in loop fee agency, I've seen they operate in a variety of different models. It can be a government agency. It can be a non-government organization. Whoever gets the authority to do it is, is empowered to do it. Um, so the in loop fee agency then takes on the responsibility. They go out, they find the sites, they do the design, they get the work constructed. They do the post-construction monitoring to generate the credits that are needed in response to the amount of money that they took in. Um, so the in fee agency does the habitat project themselves, or sometimes they contract it out through something called a full delivery mechanism, which I think is a real stroke of genius and operates in several different states. It's a very, very slick program where uh, the in fee agency works with essentially the private sector to get this work done. So it's a very interesting uh, model, and I'll speak a little bit more about it later. The in fee program, the experience we've had, most states in the U.S. have an in fee program. One that I've worked in extensively is one in North Carolina where they've done 1,300 kilometers of stream restoration through that in fee program. That, so that doesn't include the work that's been done by primitive responsible mitigation or by third-party banks. This is just the in fee program. They operate the in fee program for stream, stream buffers, wetlands, nutrients, a lot of different things. There's 45 different in lieu fee programs operating in different countries around the world. So it's a very good system and it offers many, many advantages. Um, and as some of those advantages are that it provides an interesting bridge to third party banking in the sense that if you open the market up to a third party banking system, there's a lag between the time when it's opened and when the third party banks have credits available. So basically, the in lieu fee agency can fill that temporal gap between the third party banking having credits available for sale. The other thing is that they, the in fee agency can do the planning that was previously mentioned. So you can target habitat projects. So you do watershed studies. You focus on those areas where you're gonna have better uplift. You recognize that one particular stream is never gonna be in good condition, so it's not worth working on. You focus your restoration efforts on those areas where it's gonna yield large, significant functional uplift. Um, the other thing it can do is it can provide offsetting in areas where third-party habitat bankers will not. Uh, remote areas with few impacts, there's no commercial opportunity, so the government or whoever's operating the in-loop fee program can provide a safety valve for those areas where the private sector won't, uh, won't provide that service. 
disadvantages uh, can create a large bureaucracy. The Yin Lufi program in North Carolina at one point got up to just shy of 70 people. That's seven zero people. That's a lot of people. So that's a lot of cost. So if, if it's not managed well, it can become a significant cost unto itself. The other one that's been a lesson learned for states that have set up in Luffy programs is that it's very easy to underestimate the costs of doing the projects. North Carolina got caught in this where they wound up with, you know, literally a whole bunch of unfunded liability. They didn't have the money to do the wetland restoration, the stream, excuse me, the stream restoration that they were they were responsible for. And in fact, that's where some of the push came for for preservation was because they simply didn't have the money to do outright restoration. So there are some disadvantages to NLUFI programs as well. So, and the other one is the third party banking, which has been spoken about. I'll get into it in a little bit more detail here. Again, not allowed under the Fisheries Act currently. I think it's worth consideration. I'm gonna speak about what it is and what's good and what's bad about it. Um, again, it doesn't have to replace proponent led offsetting or banking. Uh, it's, it's essentially creating a marketplace for habitat projects. And this is the thing that I really want to drive home. It creates competition. It's, you can, it creates opportunities for someone to build a better mousetrap. And that's a huge, huge advantage of third-party banking. By bringing it into the marketplace, you put market forces to work. And so it's hugely advantageous. So anyone with approved habitat bank can sell credits to anyone who needs them. So it's a, a, a clearly a marketplace. Uh, I think uh, one of the speakers mentioned, Mark mentioned the, the Ribbits website, which is what the US Army Corps of Engineers runs, which basically lists all the credits that are available in the States by, by location and price. So you can go and see, it's a marketplace. You can see what's available for sale and what they want for it and different. And so there's, there's competition. So it helps to improve the quality of the projects. Um, so Habitat bankers implement projects for the purpose of selling credits. They are developers, but instead of building strip malls, they build streams and wetlands and other environmental vet projects. Um, any, so anyone can sell extra credits to anyone else. So it's, it's a huge big business in the US. 3.8 billion in the US, uh, been doing it since the early 80s. The thing I really wanna emphasize here that it's very, very tightly regulated, uh, very, very tightly regulated. And I'll mention this in my wrap up comments. You can buy credits for almost anything, streams, wetlands, endangered species, lots of different things. 23 countries now allow third-party banking. And so I believe that there's a, a wealth of experience that Canada can draw upon to formulate a decent third-party banking system for this country. So again, advantages, um, similar to the in lieu fee program that provides certainty for project proponents, for developers. That's a huge advantage to those. Market forces competition, better project cost or better projects, better functional uplift and better ecological benefits at a lower cost. Uh, the US EPA did a study in 2008 where they compared proponent led banks or permittee responsible mitigation in lieu fee programs and third party banking. And they concluded based on that analysis that third party banking is hands down the best way to go. It was significantly better results and outcomes through third party banking. So the disadvantages on third party banking there's huge misunderstandings. I, I've run into this repeatedly when I've spoken to uh, people about it, is that it's uh, the people have a lot of misunderstandings about it. Uh, they, they think some people think it's evil to put a price on the environment. And I'm sorry, but uh, just about everybody who thinks this is a bad idea supports a carbon tax. And as far as I'm concerned, a carbon tax is the price, a price on the environment. Um, they, they don't understand that there are service areas that you can't sell credits in British Columbia to somebody in Newfoundland. Um, that you've got to sell the right type of credits or invoke some ratio to deal with the issues. So uh, again, very, very, uh, 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 you know, a lot of misunderstandings about it. That's, that's the only disadvantage that I've come up with, to be honest with you about it. So the summary comments, um, uh, basically summary on the proponent-led banks, DFO now allows, allows them and encourages them. Habitat banks are a good thing, and I think proponents should look at it seriously. I think it offers advantages to both the proponent and DFO. In lieu fee and third party banking, not allowed. They offer additional advantages over proponent led banking, certainty for the proponents, better quality projects, and lower cost for habitat. And when I say better quality projects, one of the things that's interesting is in the US, if you have a, a bank and you want credits released, 
both the federal and the state government show up every year to certify that the results that you said after you've done your monitoring report and it gets submitted, they review it, you go in the field and you verify that what you claim is happening is actually happening. So again, a very, very rigorous process. So again, summary, almost 40 years of experience in other countries, Canada can and should draw on that experience to develop programs that'll be effective. And I think DFO should get on with the task. That's it, thank you folks. Okay. Thank you very much, Brad. Uh, really appreciate your sharing us uh, all that experience and uh, yeah, enticing photographs you have there for sure. Uh, okay, on to our fourth and um, final speaker, Lucas Warner. Thank you for joining us, Lucas. And Lucas is a practitioner in the field of uh, environmental assessment. He's done a lot of work on mitigation plans, offsetting, um, project planning, and uh, has joined um, the group with Brad and is doing ongoing work on policy and uh, working with different clients on these issues. So um, over to you, Lucas. Thank you very much. Um, just do a quick check of a uh, quick mic check. Everything's yep, all sounds good. good. Excellent. All right. Maybe so. just expand your slides to uh, screen view there. There we yeah. go. Got it. Thanks. Okay. So, um, I do, uh, I've been watching the, uh, the number of participants that have joined and I, I do really, uh, I do really want to uh, thank everyone for taking two hours out of their day and, um, you know, really certainly appreciate, uh, appreciate your participation and honored by the, sh the number of participants. So I, I think that's fantastic. Um, and uh, just because we are a little bit over, um, the, uh, the good news is that my presentation is relatively short. And I'm hoping to build off of the material that has already been presented um, by taking, I guess, the next step and suggesting a concept uh, that might work uh, for certain clients um, or certain proponents um, that have national infrastructure. So I'm, I'm hoping to uh, provide a, um, I guess, a hypothetical situation that, uh, that we are working on uh, right now with, um, with at least one proponent um, and others um, who have national assets. So. Moving right into it, um, what we're going to what we're going to look at with this with this concept is national clients, national proponent um, who has infrastructure across Canada, uh, or at least in multiple provinces and territories. Um, basically, it's beyond uh, beyond one region. Um, and some examples of that uh, include the transportation industry, um, rails and highways. Uh, the energy infrastructure uh, with uh, um, oil and gas transmission lines um, and other utility lines as well. Uh, many have infrastructure clear across the country uh, or at least in uh, adjoining provinces. Um, and, uh, and so those are the clients we're going to be, be uh, looking at in this, this presentation. And so just to contrast them a little bit, if we, if we look at Canada um, and if what we'll call a local client, um, they may have infrastructure in one or more um, locations uh, within a province. So if we have uh, the colors that are popping up here are my attempt at showing different, uh, different proponents in different locations. Um, BC and Ontario show a couple of bubbles. And so if you've got infrastructure um, in one location, which I am terming local, um, then, uh, then you can still certainly, everything applies for banking. Um, however, certain proponents uh, look at Canada as one location. And so they have the infrastructure across the entire country. And just some examples, when you look at looking at the map, uh, you know, there are uh, rail, uh, rail companies that have, have infrastructure across country. Um, some even go into the States as well, but just to get an idea of what that network might look like um, as a national, a national proponent, uh, pipelines certainly uh, go across the country, um, utilities, um, electrical uh, corridors, um, electrical in infrastructure as well uh, goes into the states, across the country. Um, even our uh, Trans-Canada Highway has, uh, has infrastructure literally across the country. So I, I, some of this stuff has been talked about, so I'll try and condense it um, as what the uh, a national habitat bank uh, might look like. Um, one of the important components is uh, establishing a habitat banking arrangement. Um, and this is essentially 
uh, you, you have to create the ledger. Um, and that is essentially the bank account. So you, you create the bank account. Uh, it is signed by both parties. It defines the terms and conditions uh, of the arrangement. It will uh, outline how credits will be calculated ahead of time. So that's all included. It will also define how credits will be released. And, and we'll touch on that a little bit in, uh, in another slide later. Um, it will also define, which is important, where credits can be used. And we'll touch on that as well. Um, and then lastly, we have to prepare an annex uh, describing each project that will generate credits under, under the bank. So you can have one bank uh, with multiple projects that are captured under this bank. And that's what the addicts will describe um, and the credits. So the concept of a national bank could look something like this slide here. We have one habitat bank that could cover the entire country. So you establish one, one bank upfront um, and then you could open or establish sub accounts, um, so to speak. Uh, could be set up for different regions. And so you, you establish a national bank for your, for your company, and then you look at areas such as high density infrastructure. So where do you have lots of infrastructure? Um, where do you have frequent maintenance projects uh, that may require offsetting uh, or access to credits? Um, or um, in certain regions, you may uh, be planning future projects. And, and that's that's where we would look at setting up uh, regional accounts or regional sub accounts um, that would cover those, uh, those particular areas under the, the national bank. And, and as time moves forward, um, if certain areas develop more infrastructure, uh, if there are uh, existing areas that, uh, that are devoid of infrastructure, but come up in the future um, as areas you would like to develop, then of course your national bank would, would be able to open an account um, or you could target that account for, for, few, for more projects. Now, it's, uh, it is a concept, but, uh, but we have been speaking to, to some folks uh, within DFO uh, about the idea of a national concept. And just some initial feedback um, is that they are supportive of this concept. Um, it will, which is good news, I'll pause there for effect. It is good news uh, that they are supportive of this concept. Um, it's important to note that it's going to involve uh, senior levels of both the proponents um, and DFO. Uh, as, as a national bank, um, obviously, obviously it's going to involve several regions to discuss um, and several signatures and approvals um, at higher levels. And so that needs to be understood and taken into consideration when planning for, uh, for a national bank. Um, and so that, that will just take some extra work uh, up front. Um, one of the things that, that we did here uh, from DFO uh, is that when DFO allow, first allowed and was, was coming up with habitat banking is that national proponents or proponents with national infrastructure um, are exactly the types of proponents that DFO had in mind or was thinking about when, they, uh, when habitat banking was added to the Fisheries Act. Um, their large infrastructure uh, and to, uh, to Mark Posh's point earlier, uh, research finding that larger projects uh, were somewhat more successful um, at achieving functional the success and the habitat function. Larger proponents um, tend to or lend themselves to larger projects and larger offsetting needs or larger needs in general under the Fisheries Act. And so there is good alignment um, with national clients, national proponents and national banks. Now there are some challenges um, and these have come up through working on offsetting and in the past um, and working on uh, initially working on some banking opportunities. Uh, and this has been the first bullet here of large service areas. So the service area is where you can use where you can use the bank. So if you've got if you establish a project and, and do a do a habitat bank. Um, as the earlier slides mentioned, uh, you define where you can access those credits. So where your future projects uh, may be held, you will know uh, if you can uh, access those credits by defining service area. And the, uh, the challenge with, with some of the projects 
um, that has at least been communicated to me by, uh, by proponents who have tried to do this in the past already um, is that the service area tends to be a bit of a stumbling block and a challenge uh, when negotiating habitat banks. And so the larger the service area for a bank, um, the more area, uh, meaning the more infrastructure uh, that a proponent has can be captured within that service area. And so it becomes more, uh, I guess, uh, more attractive to proponents to do, to do these banks um, because they will know that they have more of their infrastructure captured within the service area. Uh, another, another major challenge has been um, what is acceptable for suitable projects. So not only what is acceptable for a suitable banking project, but once, once the bank is, is established, if you have a, an infrastructure project um, that requires offsetting and you would like to use your bank, what, what, what projects do you have? What are they acceptable? You know, can you use the bank for it? And so that needs to be defined um, and will need to be, uh, it's going to be a challenging uh, part of the negotiation and something that we need to be ready for. Um, I'll say early credit release schedule here um, in the sense that if, if a bank uh, is under construction and is established, and as we go through the post-construction monitoring uh, requirements, um, after year one, year two, year three, we will start to get data on how the bank is functioning. And so the, um, I guess the, in, the interest will be that after year one, there should be a certain per percentage of the credits available for release on proponents' future projects. And that, that would really be helpful for proponents in that if they've got five years of post-construction monitoring, 10 years of post-construction monitoring, they will know that some of the credits will be available to them before 10 years, before five years. Um, that's a very long time to wait for it. And so this is something that, uh, that we've heard uh, from proponents um, and discussed uh, with DFO and is something that will be, it will be a challenge. Um, it's something that we'll have to work through in negotiating a bank. Uh, something else um, that we've heard from proponents as well is, is their understanding of future needs. And so it's all, not always known where you're going to have projects and when you're going to have those projects. And so this, this is a bit of a planning challenge to, to understand your infrastructure, understand your needs um, for the future um, so that we can, we can plan banks uh, where you'll need them. Uh, and of course, there is an initial investment um, habitat offsetting is, is, uh, is usually done along uh, with a project, on a project by project basis. Um, and so you're, you can look at it as essentially as, um, as, as paying a bill. Um, whereas uh, developing a habitat bank, is a, is a, there's an initial investment um, before, you, before you need it. And so there, there needs to be an understanding that, that this, is, this is an investment. It will require capital um, and effort up front. Um, however, uh, as, uh, as Brad mentioned and, and the other presenters mentioned, um, once it is established and the credits, um, you know, the, the, uh, the construction monitoring is showing um, the value of the bank, you now have certainty uh, with that bank um, and your future projects can now benefit from that. Uh, so in summary, um, habitat banking is now included in the Fisheries Act, uh, which is exciting. Um, it's been mentioned too that DFO is encouraging habitat banking, um, where obviously where appropriate, um, and, uh, and that's good news. Um, we've discussed about habitat banks, how they offer advantages to both proponents um, and to DFO, and that national proponents are who DFO has in mind. Um, so the, uh, the national, a national bank, um, if we only have to set up one banking arrangement um, and then sub accounts can be developed under, there's an initial cost to developing that arrangement, but it doesn't need to be developed for each subsequent bank or each additional project. And so there are some cost savings um, and effort uh, savings once we develop um, a national bank. Um, and as mentioned, there are some challenges to overcome, but, but we can work on those. Uh, so with that, I will end it and uh, I guess uh, pass it back to Bill. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lucas. Really appreciate that. And uh, 
more good fruit for thought and uh, we'll cut to the next part of our program now and uh, we, we're we're short a bit of time compared to what we thought but that's okay um, i'm gonna suggest some things that could speed things up a little bit um, the first one is that one of our core objectives here of the webinar was to share with each other both the participants and the speakers some of the top things on their mind based on their own experience and what they've heard today that they think are important to share with the Department of Fisheries and Oceans on their habitat banking and offsetting policy. So in order to facilitate that while we're having conversation and answering questions, I invite people to, including the panelists, to go into the chat, not the question and answer tab, but the chat tab, and just note as they come to mind, or if you already have them, the things that you think uh, people should consider in regard to their comments to DFO. That way, Sam and I, after the webinar, can distill those out, send them out to people, and they can look at those options if they're planning on making a submission or uh, going on to the online portal with uh, Let's Talk Fish Habit or with Talk Fish Habitat. So you can work on that. Um, the other two things we're going to do, one is we're going to get to the questions that have been posted in the Q&A. And as I said, we may not get through all of them, but feel free to put questions in. Um, and if it's tagged to a specific panelist, please note that. And uh, Sam and I will do our best to get those questions to the panelist afterwards and uh, get a response to you. The third thing we wanted to do was uh, we'd hoped with this dialogue and the presentations, we would cover as broad a spectrum of different sectors as possible who have strong views on and experience on this issue. Uh, so whether you're from the NGO community, perhaps conservation authority, local government, um, indigenous group, we've got a bit of time now I'd like to offer for anyone who has three or four minutes of kind of presentation they just like to make on their perspective from their sector on this issue, you can just uh, click the raise your hand button at the bottom of your tab there and Sam will give you the mic and the video uh, access to say a few words about uh, your perspective here. So if anyone wants to do that, I'll invite that now. And uh, if we do not get any hands from anyone, um, so there's Nick LaPointe from Canadian Wildlife Federation. Sam, do you wanna provide access to Nick there? Yep, we have Pat Matthew joining us here first. That okay. was the first hand I saw. Great. Hi, it's Pat Matthew. I um, work in uh, Kamloops, British Columbia in the Thompson Shoe Shop. We're part of the Fraser system. And uh, yeah, listening to this whole conversation about habitat banking and, you know, the policies and all that around it, the, the development, it's uh, it's very concerning, you know, in that, uh, you know, the discussion is talked about it, you know, in, you know, in the States as being a, a big business, um, you know, that it's there's proprietary development between DFO and, and, and a proponent. And, uh, you know, so I guess my concern is, you know, we want to ensure, at least in our territory, that that we have a say in, in, in how habitat banking and crediting is developed and implemented in our territory here um, regardless if it's a national corporation or, or a local company um, you know that's that's where we want to see this go and as far as this national engagement process we're going to try our best to make comments you know listening to the whole the whole situation it's very complicated you know we we, in our area, we have uh, salmon species that are listed by Koswick as endangered or threatened, just about all of them. And so, you know, the, you know, how cumulative effects, you know, habitat banking, all those are dealt with. You know, we want to have a say. We, need, we think there needs to be more than just uh, concepts like preservation. You know, if, if, there's a, if there's a greater need to protect habitat and, and those species, uh, you know, we want to, we want to have a say in it. We like, you know, the whole idea of no net loss, um, you know, we believe that there should be net gain instead of net loss, especially where, you know, there's species at risk um, in our territory. So <clears throat> I'll leave it there. It sounds to me like, a, you know, very complicated process quantifying, 
you know, uh, you know, trading, all those types of things, very, very difficult to, for us to engage in that technical conversation. You know, I think our approach is going to be around, you know, some of our principles around and traditional knowledge and principles around things like, like no net loss and, and those types of things. Uh, that's the level I think we only we can function at, and, and we're going to try to make DFO accountable in the Pacific region or in our specific region here in the BC interior for cumulative effects, uh, banking, all those types of things. We're going to bring them to task on it locally here, and uh, with whatever uh, forces we can we can muster. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Pat. Really appreciate your commentary there, and uh, just a note that for those who haven't looked at it, the uh, one of the key questions in DFO's Talkfish Habitat uh, policy um, review there is how we can improve or how the department can improve engagement and integration with Indigenous groups on this policy, both in its development and its application. So uh, if you know people want to comment on those, there's it's one of the five key questions that's asked in the in the document. Okay, Sam, um, you had another person in line there? Yep, we have Nick LaPointe uh, from Canadian Wildlife Federation joining us today. Hi, Nick. Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, I'll try to be quick because there's so many great questions here. And Pat, you know, really good point about net gain. Uh, I think um, there's there's kind of no point in doing any of this uh, if net gain isn't a principle that's it, it encompassed in each of the habitat banking or offsetting decisions. Um, we've lost so much ground, we're losing so much ground that, you know, economizing our, our waterways just doesn't seem like a good move. But if there's so much additionality baked into offsets and habitat banks that it not only deals with the uncertainty, but also turns back the clock on that a little bit more, I'd certainly be more comfortable around it. Um, I just wanted to touch on the in lieu fee uh, element of this. Um, I think it has a particularly valuable role to play with small projects um, because small projects can't be offset effectively. You know, if you if you infill 50 square meters of habitat, you can't go and create a functional 50 square meter uh, habitat cost effectively or ecologically. But, uh, you know, there's still that footprint on the landscape that needs to be uh, compensated for in some way. And, um, you know, for all of this it tied with net gain, obviously all of these things have to follow the mitigation hierarchy and small projects are good in that you, you know, you can avoid harm up to some extent and you can mitigate harm for those. Um, but they many inevitably do have a residual footprint and really the only other option to deal with that residual footprint for these small projects is, uh, is an in lieu fee. Um, which would discourage that small project and it would create resources for uh, restoration. Um, and uh, so a couple of key ingredients there is those resources have to be dedicated to restoration. They can't just be a tax or go into general government revenue. Um, and uh, DFO is not currently considering them, but they are enabled by the act. There are four new fees that DFO could charge under the act, at least a couple of which could be used to charge in lieu fees. And uh, DFO could uh, have those fees currently be uh, given to uh, ECCC to be managed under the Environmental Damages Fund. So the framework is there, the possibility is there, and uh, I would really like to see that as a, uh, an addition to the management framework for those small projects uh, from a conservation perspective. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Nick, appreciate that. Any other individuals uh, from different sectors who wanna share a bit of commentary on their point of view on this? Any others there, Sam, with their hand up? No more hands, but we have plenty of questions. Okay. Can I maybe just comment on in lieu fee arrangements? Because um, I'm less of a fan of them than I'm hearing from others. Uh, I, I did a study with Adam Dreidzik about four or five years ago, and looking at in lieu fee First of all, I didn't wait to an answer to a, an answer to my question of can I comment on this? <laughs> sure, fire away. Seeing, fire away. Okay. It's a good dialogue. Well, yeah. Well, that, there was a couple of limitations that we found when we looked at how these systems actually work, and and I think this was echoed in the in some of the U.S. systems early on. 
Uh, a lot of the work that was put into them was in facilitating payment into the fund as a way of streamlining permitting, um, but less work was put into principles and any rigor about how payment is made out and the ecological uh, benefits that are expected from that. So it um, in often, I think, becomes an administrative arrangement that is not necessarily translated into effective uh, ecological benefits. And I'll just leave it at that. Okay. I, I don't, I think it can work. I just don't think it often does. Yeah, no, valid uh, cautionary note. So thanks for that. So yeah, we've got um, uh, half an hour here. So as I mentioned, feel free to uh, put your points of view in the chat so that people will get those later and have them for consideration in their input. And if they choose to do that with DFO. And I'll throw this over to Sam now to start to go through some of the questions that we have received at this point in the Q&A. Thank you, Bill. Um, tons of questions. Uh, I think we have about 17 and I'll do my best to juggle. Um, I see some uh, repeats from multiple people, so I'll um, be as generous and cover as many as we can. And as we mentioned earlier, any questions that are not answered, uh, we'll do our best to follow up afterwards. So this first note from Cameron, thank you for joining us, Cameron. Uh, in response to Mark's informative presentation, he says, thank you. It highlights the biggest issue we have for catchment wide ecosystem restoration, which is urgently needed for climate change mitigation in the next decade. This is a call to action for enhancement and restoration projects to be prioritized on both the federal and provincial levels trying to promote collaborative community-based catchment slash watershed management across Canada. There are integrated watershed management plans for many cities, municipalities, areas, et cetera, across the country. There are also numerous watershed associations and or alliances, which already have the right collaborative community, communities established, working together and already focusing on the enhancement and restoration projects. So the question is, if we focus on catchment wide freshwater ecology, can we not easily use the data we have within a catchment or watershed to identify projects for enhancement and restoration priority or invite investors to fund enhancement projects for habitat banks and credits? So welcome back, Mark. Hi, uh, I was here the whole time. I may have stepped away and got my COVID shot, but I was I was paying attention. Great. Um, uh, I think I think in principle or in theory it, it should be easy. I, I, I think in practice it isn't. So if we look at uh, an example, this would be like stream crossings and how do we prioritize removing of problematic crossings? You know the accounting can be so different. If you're looking at just am I going to open up linear um, kilometers of stream or am I going to prioritize more charismatic species that we care about and how do we account for those differences? And and the problem is people differ in their preferences, right? I mean, I mean, it's easy, easy enough to probably to do for species at risk that we are mandated to, to care about, but I think it gets really complicated um, when we try and get to the accounting. And then I, um, it also gets uh, complicated for, um, yeah, for, I guess, for DFO to make, make those, uh, those credits clearly articulated. I, I prefer to do a catchment basin approach because uh, ecological research obviously suggests that connectivity is just a massively important component of, of, of fish, uh, maintaining a fisheries life cycle. And so we should be, we should be thinking in an ecological context, but obviously highlighting just some of the difficulties in doing that across the landscape, I, I think I should just, you know, mention. <laughs> uh, so as much as I prefer it, I, I think um, the devil is always in the details of how we go about doing it. Thanks, Mark. I see Brad um, would like to jump in. Yeah, if I might, I, I agree um, that there's, you know, the watershed's the right way to go at it. And indeed, several jurisdictions have already done that. If you talk to Lucas, I mean, he'll tell you that Calgary's got a priority list under, you know, or Alberta Environment's got their fisheries program. They've got a priority list of restoration sites available if somebody's looking for them. If you go to the Toronto area, the Conservation Authority's got a a priority list of, of stream projects they'd like to undertake. So this work has in fact been done in some jurisdictions. Um, and so it, 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 it can be tapped into in those jurisdictions. So absolutely no, 
no desire to reinvent the wheel if it's already been done. But I think Mark raises a good point about how, you know who who decides. Some somebody's got to set the framework for how the prioritization is done. And if it, if it's a conservation authority, then that's fine. But you know it's it is it is a challenge in terms of how you decide how you're going to rank them. So I think it's a great idea, though. Thank you. Go ahead, Lucas. Just to add on to um, looking at it as from it as an you know, ecological function, um, while we're focused here on, on fisheries, um, understanding that if we are if we're doing a restoration uh, work on a stream, um, there are there's there's other um, beneficiaries in the you know we can look at soil management, we can look at migratory birds um, habitat, we can look at wildlife, um, and they all benefit from restoration work around streams. And so I think it's, you know, by looking at it from an like ecological point of view, um, there's, there's more expertise that can come to the table uh, and there, uh, we can actually have the opportunity to quantify the gains or at least study, implement and quantify the gains for, for more than just fish, um, which is also a, a, another benefit of looking at it from a, a systems point of view. Great. Do you have anything else to add, David, before we move to the next question? Don't want to put you on the spot there. Mark Mark uh, has raised his hand to, to jump back in. No, I don't have anything to say. I was just putting something in the comments. <laughs> Thank you. I, I have a quick comment. I think that that's maybe tangential, but I think could be important is that the, the implementation of this can utilize sort of infrastructures that are already in place, like the professional biologist designation in Alberta. They have a similar one in BC. There was talk about doing one in Ontario. Uh, implementation of restoration can be done uh, in an with an accreditation adjoined to it, I think that would be allow these ecological principles to permeate throughout the profession. And I think that would be a real uh, benefit in, in considering. Thank you, Mark. And great to have um, the rest of the panel chiming in. Uh, another one here for, for Mark, uh, Daryl asks, when you state that a diverse solution is needed for habitat banking, would this include third-party delivery? i.e. the owner of the bank can sell or trade to users of the bank. So, yeah, so that's a tough one because we don't, we haven't really researched that. So I try and always stick with the sort of science advice with, uh, with that in mind. When you think about other, other uh, I guess, programs like this, like transferable quotas, which is, is somewhat related, transferable quotas have been shown in a lot of uh, cold water and temperate systems to to work well. That's where they, you can buy quotas and and, and uh, exchange them and transfer them. So I, I guess in theory I wouldn't be against it, but I, I really would feel uh, it's a little bit outside the scope of what, what we've been looking into. Um, any of the other panelists or I'll move on. Um, one here from Kirsten, and, and uh, it says, one of the disadvantages to proponents that I've seen for habitat banks is the long lead time. Habitat banks need to be completed and certified in advance of impacts occurring, and many proponents don't start to consider habitat offsetting until they're reasonably certain of the scale of impacts they will be creating. Question is, how long does it typically take to certify a habitat bank? Are we talking 10 years of monitoring to certify that uh, it's working or can it happen more quickly than that? Can I dive in, Sam? Yep, absolutely. Uh, You've raised a good point. The time lag is an issue, but DFO, at least in the banks that I've negotiated, uh, much like you negotiate the service area, you also negotiate the credit release schedule. And uh, you can usually get some of the credits out long before the completion of the, of the monitoring. So the, it's usually a phase. They'll give you uh, like 10 or 20% when it's constructed. And then they'll give you each another uh, for each year of post-construction monitoring, you get another 10 or 20% out. So you can get credits out. Um, the comment about, you know, whether it's going to be in time for the development suggests that the proponent is thinking about this as trying to get credits for a particular project. And that's not the intent of banking. Banking is intended to be anticipatory that you will have, you know, you're going to have impacts for a variety of different projects. And so you go ahead and build a bank. So 
don't try to think of it in terms of getting credits out in time for your project because that's not really what a bank's about. It's supposed to be done in advance. So, but again, you're right, 10 years is way too long. And the banks that I've set up, DFO was willing to release credits long before the completion of the bank. So you can get some of them, you just don't get all of them out until the post-construction monitor. One of the frustrations for me was that the, when I negotiated several of the banks, DFO wanted more rigorous post-construction monitoring for a habitat bank than they wanted for an offsetting project. And somebody needs to explain to me how that makes sense because they have an offsetting project, they know they're gonna have impacts and they're good. they only want five years of monitoring, but then for a habitat bank, they want 10 years of monitoring and they want more parameters measured. And that's what I'm getting at about trying to incentivize banking. Well, you don't set the bar higher for a bank than you do for a project that you know is gonna have impacts, that's lunacy. So they need to make these a little bit more commensurate. Thanks. Go ahead, Lucas. Um, I think just coming at it from a, di a different perspective too, with, with an offset, um, you know, we, we work with, with DFO when we, when they, I guess, when they tell us that, that we need offsetting, our project's going to cause residual impacts that require offsetting. And so we, we develop a project um, and that project carries post-construction monitoring. It also carries a letter of credit, um, a financial, a financial uh, lien, um, and in a, I guess, in a similar way, or I'll, I'll, I'll suggest in a similar way, uh, the proponent has years after the project um, that 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 some of that letter of credit will still be um, their responsibility until the post-construction monitoring can show that the offsetting has met all of its all of its goals and achievement, achievements, and so. The, the, the benefit of an offset is you, you get the approval for the project up front and DFO provides that approval before any of it is proven. Um, and sort of to Brad's point, um, whereas with a Habitat Bank, if we could negotiate a, a release, uh, an early release of the credits, um, like an offset, you, you still get to the end of the post-construction monitoring where you end up with full value, hopefully if it's working. Um, and so there, there is still there is still some some risk and some uncertainty with the offsetting approach. Yet DFO um, is is willing to approve it before you know they, they give the value, I guess, to the to the client. Um, and yet it, you you still actually carry that risk as long as, as some of these banking projects would, where where the current thought is DFO would give you the the value at the end. And so. Um, I, I just wanted to provide that perspective um, and uh, uh, and maybe maybe help help uh, with un maybe understanding uh, what the banking does you know as what it can provide and what it doesn't. Thank you, Lucas. Okay, thanks. Hey, Sam. I just noticed. Uh, I know we have a lot of questions, and just uh, maybe if we just have one question and one answer uh, from this point on, just to try and cover as many questions as possible sure. in the last fifteen minutes here. Okay, um, and I'm noticing uh, lots of great activity uh, in the chat from Bill's prompt. So again, if you would like to share two to three key points that um, you have provided or plan to provide within your feedback to DFO and uh, their uh, Fish and Fish Habitat Protection Program regarding this topic, habitat offsetting and banking policy. Um, so I will move on to the next question. And we have from here, from Jack Daly, and he asks, can any of the presenters address uh, the extent to which consultation must take place with communities affected by projects? For example, if fish habitat is altered in an indigenous community, is there a duty to consult that community when developing the offset? Is there a geographic limit to how far the offset can occur? So to the Any whole panel. for that one? Okay, David. Well, certainly the second question, the geographic limit uh, to is is essentially what's met by the service area. And that's usually um, set either on the, the project side or on the, the offset side. Um, the, the question about consultation, I think is an, is a good one. Um, clearly, there's a constitutional, uh, duty to consult um, under appropriate circumstances for development. I think there's been a lot less thought than there needs to be about how to involve not only First Nations, but 
but communities and others in uh, offset planning. Uh, it seems that um, a lot of our, our public oversight of the development process uh, is um, sidetracked when it comes to planning for offsets. And, and if offsets are gonna have uh, both adverse impacts of their own or delivering benefits to uh, adjacent communities, then uh, community voices uh, should, should be part of that process. Thank you, David. Uh, we'll move on to the next. This one is uh, from Anonymous for Brad. Um, the question is, what is your experience with monitoring and maintenance of restored habitats? How can these be incorporated for the long term to ensure restoration habitats function effectively and require little or no maintenance or ensure that maintenance is done to ensure functionality? What resources are out there on what works or doesn't and why in terms of uh, restoration? A lot of focus on band-aids and not the actual issues. Uh, what do you suggest proponents, governments, et cetera, do to determine and address the bigger picture? Well, you're on mute there, Brad. Got it, got it, got yeah. it. I just, um, it's a big question. Um, it, basically, uh, DFO right now is currently working on uh, protocols for post-construction monitoring to try and uh, introduce standardization of which parameters for how long, uh, whether pre and both pre and post are required. So that will go a long way to solving that because if those parameters are selected appropriately for the project and, and the targets are set based on the conditions in the authorization, then it's pretty clear whether they've met it or not. Uh, as for the maintenance, yeah, I mean, if you're not if you're not meeting the targets, you either have to go in and modify the project or, or go somewhere and start over and do it over again. So, um, you know, it's really critical that, that we get it right. Interestingly enough, a good restoration project, uh, um, you know, basically the, the maintenance uh, requirements will, will, will uh, uh, reduce fairly substantially after probably the first year or two, uh, certainly in the field of stream restoration where I work. Uh, most of your problems occur in the first couple of years, and then it uh, really kind of fades out. So uh, once you're into, you know, past year five, you're really not uh, requiring much, you shouldn't require any maintenance at all. And in the long run, I mean, if this is a natural system, natural systems don't need maintenance, so it shouldn't need maintenance. So I think I, I've made a stab at answering part of that rather lengthy question, so hope that helps. Thank you, Brad. Um, we'll take this one from Russell here. Thank you for joining us. Uh, and uh, they say, well, I assume that a national bank would actually be a collection of smaller regional banks to account for and offset potential habitat losses in each of those specific regions. So is that an assumption correct? Maybe Lucas or, or any of the other panelists? It, it, certainly, it certainly is. And, look, and obviously Brad was, Brad was nodding as well. Um, the um, it, 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 it's, it's a concept, so we have yet to define it officially, but it, it is the idea that, that the, the proponent or, or organization would be able to establish, you know, an interest to do habitat banking um, and has, you know, lo different locations that it could do it. Um, and that agreement is captured at the national scale. Uh, and then Obviously, the, the, the projects can be constructed locally, and then the, and they they can be captured in what I proposed as you know a sub account, regional account. Those are not DFO terms. Um, none of this is defined in the act yet, uh, and it's just it, that's how it, it could look. Um, one one of the things that that I that I uh, I failed to bring up that I wanted to mention that Mark brought up is the importance of connectivity and uh, doing looking at um, it it. it, it supports the, uh, the, the ecological view as well is, is with larger projects, um, with regional you know, projects, whether it's done under a national bank or where there's, there's a need, um, doing large projects, looking, looking broader does allow you to look at connectivity with other projects that are there, habitats that are pristine or, or that are, um, I guess we're not looking to encourage preservation. Um, however, further downstream, further upstream, uh, there may be really good opportunities for restoration, and then that would provide an overall large um, habitat area that is functioning properly. So uh, I just wanted to add that comment there that Mark brought up about connectivity. 
great. Thank you. Um, a note here from Terry, what are your suggestions on how to include Indigenous groups and address concerns of impacts in one territory and benefits in another? So to the whole panel. I'm That's not sure I understand, Sam. I'm, I'm puzzled. So we're trying to, I mean, I get the consultation part, but it's the impacts in one area and the benefits in another. Is that what we're getting at? Yeah, and as an example, I know I, I've had some conversations who have called us at Aquatic Habitat Canada about this, uh, Brad, that say a certain development project happens in their territory, but the service area that they're looking at is bigger and that they lose what they see as oh. salmon spawning habitat in their territory. And the benefit in the form of offset happens somewhere else far in another territory. Well, the one solution would be for DFO to allow third party banks in the indigenous community, set up a 30 party bank and then sell the credits to the developer. Thank you. Um, another question here for, for Lucas uh, and Cameron says, thank you, Lucas. I uh, really appreciate your insight and presentation. Great work and info in terms of a habitat bank. Are the big banks of Canada not calling for this as well? Um, thank you, Cameron. Appreciate that. Um, I, I, I would also, um, and, uh, and I, I think, you know, one of the, one of the things with, with the banking, um, that, uh, that I think, I think it was Mark that mentioned the number of banks that they studied in the States, uh, was, was very large. And, uh, and I think Brad mentioned a very small number that's done in Canada. Um, and, and I think, you know, as I, I, there was a comment earlier about in, inviting investors. Um, and, and I think that's, I, I think it's, it's been interesting looking into the banking, the banking opportunities in that, you know, with the, with the U S systems, while they're flaws, uh, there's been a lot of habitat restoration work done. Um, Mark pointed out rightfully that a lot of it is preservation, um, but there's still been a lot of work done. There's been a lot of lessons learned. There's lots of work that's been done that can be studied. Uh, there's been great strides forward with, with the, the work that's been done. Um, and, uh, and, and like Brad was commenting, is, is any incentivizing we can do in Canada to, 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 to push, whether it's done by offsetting, third party, banking and new fee program, um, I welcome any uh, discussion of how we can get habitat restoration done, you know, in Canada. I think we need more of it. I think it needs to be, you know, I think it needs to be incentivized and I'd love to look at it at an ecological level so that other components of the ecosystem can benefit. Um, and if, if the big banks can help, <laughs> I, would, I would welcome their, uh, I would welcome their, 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 uh, their involvement. Great. Thank you. Uh, Mark, you have your hand raised. Yeah, I just maybe want to add something quickly to uh, what Lucas mentioned. The one thing of when we were studying uh, offsetting and banking and the, the two parts that I mentioned was the, the ease in which we were able to look at some of the US data because of the Ribbits um, protocol has uh, sort um, very clear standard things that need to be reported on. And one of the, I guess, frustrations I have with trying to study offsetting in Canada is just how difficult that is to get and how widely different the, the, the monitoring reports that we're looking at are. Um, we have to use the freedom of information request to often get data. It's onerous uh, and what we get back is, is not standardized. And so there may be one, one thing to consider is that uh, it allows a learning, the, the, the learning process to occur. I mean, you may not get it totally correct in the first shot at it, but what adaptive management teaches us, if we can evaluate and then have a feedback to improve upon, then we're going to get better through time. And now the only way I can imagine us to have that proper feedback is if we have standard reporting that uh, allows people like myself to look into it. And, and again, if I could add, I, I completely agree, Mark. Uh, you know, it's a very transparent process in the U.S. where you can go in and get Literally in the state of North Carolina, every post-construction monitoring report is publicly available on a website to be downloaded and they're a standard format. So I think it's huge. But the other thing is that if you bring it into the marketplace, then, then you'll be forced out of business if you don't do good work. And so it's a good way to improve the quality is by creating competition. Great. Um, Bill, I'm just looking at the time now. Uh, did you want to take one more? 
Yeah, let's do one more. Awesome. Okay. So a question here from Douglas uh, and they have said in areas in Northern Canada, it can be difficult to find appropriate areas for offsetting or banking. I like the idea of a fee that can be used for research in many of these Northern areas where there is a paucity of fisheries data. These funds could improve understanding of fish populations and habitat, which in turn improves the understanding of potential effects. I know this is very controversial. DFO tried this once with the diamond mine in the Northwest Territories, where the proponent paid $1 million to a fund that DFO managed to research um, or habitat improvements, research habitat improvements. DFO was hammered by NGOs and media for doing this as per Brad's slide of perception of selling habitat. Thoughts? Please, Brad. I'm dead set against spending the money on research. Um, I believe the money's got to go to offsetting. Uh, we can learn a lot more by doing better post-construction monitoring and learning on it. But yeah, I don't think we're, we need to be funding research. That's just that's just crazy. If DFO needs money to do research, they should find money to do research and not, not do that. I understand that there's a scarcity of sites that can be restored in northern climates. But again, then we need to start and look at, do we go, and again, in the AHC's paper that was published, what, last year, there was discussion about this desire to have all the offsetting occur immediately adjacent to the point of impact is really a bad policy. They need to get more forward thinking about it. And let, I mean, let it go to other places where it's needed. I mean, you can't find a, a damaged site in the Northwest Territories in many cases to do the offsetting or restoration on. So, so go somewhere else. I think we had Mark's hand first and then David's as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I politely disagree with that, the research. I mean, obviously I would be biased, but uh, I think that the, there is op opportunities for offsetting to promote research. I think right now 10% can go towards research. And I think the opportunity, I mean, research allows us to learn and, and create that adaptive management approach. Um, and, and that's, I think, really fundamental for improving it. If we're going to spend all this money uh, for, you know, proponents to, to do banking and, and consultants to implement it, you should be allotting some for research because otherwise you're, you're not going to be getting that, that learning from it. Dave? Are we out of time? Can you tell you're the last word. Okay. Um, well, in general, I agree with Brad. I don't think we should be spending offset money on research. It should be delivering benefits on the ground in the ecosystems. Um, if research is needed, we need to finance that too, but through other mechanisms. But I, uh, in the case of this one that's raised by this question, uh, where we're in a first cut scenario where the development is the first one, there are there is no pre-existing disturbance to restore uh, no real availability for offsetting. I could uh, get my head around using a fund to develop um, whatever is necessary for the long-term resilience of that ecosystem so it can withstand future threats and maybe to fortify that community with research capacity to do that. I'll try and cut it off there. Okay, great. Well, thank you all. I um, want to offer my apologies to those who had questions in the in the system that didn't get addressed. Um, I would invite you as per our objective of improving our network and getting to know each other that if you have a specific question that's unanswered, you can contact uh, the panelists directly. Um, and um, uh, we'll also, as I said, try and distill out those questions to send to the panelists and see if we can get answers to put in the document that we'll send back to you which will include that and the uh, points that people submitted in the chat in regard to their priority points of view in um, regard to submissions to DFO on this policy. And once again, the deadline for the first round of submissions on their online portal is April 30th. And they will be having subsequent sessions, but I know I, I talked to some of the folks there who said what they get in this first round is gonna kind of form their thinking about who they engage with and how they engage the next steps of the consultation dialogue. So uh, I really encourage you to get your ideas in if you're inclined to do so. And um, thanks to all, a big thanks to Sam for managing all of our back and forth behind the scenes with the chat and uh, getting us set up on the system. Very much appreciated, Sam. And thanks again to all the speakers. 
uh, really respect your time and energy towards this complex issue, which uh, obviously we and many others care about. And uh, as you move forward in your uh, habitat restoration efforts, uh, may the force be with you all. So thanks again and uh, have a good day and the rest of your week. And bye for now. Thanks everyone. Take care.